Good afternoon, all of you people who are our faithful biobuffers and my life story people. And today we have my life story. I'm so happy we have another one going on. I'm Carrie Otto. I would like to uh, advise you to turn off your cell phones if you happen to have them with you. Today is going to be our third and uh, rendition of My Life, My Story. Uh, we had a couple of great ones to begin with. We had Darlene telling us about Kenya and the, the street boys. Then we had the Larsons, and there were a lot of funny experiences they told along the way. And today we have Ann Jones. And I think Ann has the most fascinating story. And so I'm going to let her tell you all about it. Go ahead. Well, I have to admit, I've found it a fascinating life, and I've enjoyed it a lot. So let's start from the beginning. I was born and raised in Minnesota. I arrived in a blizzard, which we now refer to as Alberta Clippers. Um, it's a strong winter storm coming in off the Canadian prairies, and it zips into Minnesota. So on January 8th of 1948, the newspaper said, baby girl born to Rudolph and Mabel Anderson of Ashby, Minnesota. And uh, I was the baby girl. The blizzard was pretty strong, and my mother and I were kept in the hospital for a couple of days more because there was no way of getting us home because the roads were closed. Now, the home that we came to was outside of Ashby, Minnesota which had a population of about 500 people, smaller than who live here at Royal Oak. So when somebody says they're from a small town, I know small towns. Uh, the farmhouse we had had running water, a flush toilet, a bathtub, electricity, a party line crank telephone with the operator in Ashby. It was a small extended family with my grandmother's living close, uh, Carrie and Matilda. My mother, Mabel, was 28, and my dad, Rudolph, was 48. My sister was 18 months old. Unusual in that both of my parents had post-secondary education. My mother was a registered nurse, and my father had attended the University of Minnesota for 10 winter quarters, graduating with a bachelor's degree in agriculture. That took determination. He farmed spring, summer, and fall quarters, and came to St. Paul in the winter to continue his education. Like most farms at the time, a mixture of grain, corn, um, hay crops were raised, as well as dairy and beef cattle. We had chickens, one duck, the occasional pig, and a menagerie of cats and dogs. Anybody who's been on a farm knows the collection. My sister and I were feral kids. We were just, you went out in the morning and you came back in when you were hungry. Helping with age-appropriate chores was just how it went. We played and explored outdoors all summer and part of the winter. It had to be at least 10 below zero before that we were allowed to go outside and play in the winter. Warm it up. We had a rotation, rotating collection of pets. Uh, and on a farm, when you want a new pet, you just go out and catch something and name it. And we uh, did that regularly with cats. And we had a whole collection of cats. When the barn cats grew up and uh, got a little older, then they went back outside. But we got to play with them when they were kittens. But my mother always said, you have to give it a shampoo. So we got pretty good at washing kittens. And I can tell you right now, you can't unsee a wet cat. <laughs> it's one of those things that's just, I, I, it's vivid in my memory. We also had a duck named Eisenhower. Now, Eisenhower was one of those little colored ducks you get at Easter. We'd get at Easter. They dyed them a different color, like blue and yellow and various colors. Well, Eisenhower, I don't remember his color, but, but he was mean. And he chased my sister and I around, which my parents didn't think a whole lot of until he chased my mother and bit her. And then we ate him. <laughs> it's just how it goes. Uh, we also had calves that we had as pets and some cows, and we had a pony. She was old when she arrived at our place and only lived for a few years, but we did have a fun time with her. We had a lot of social activities. were mainly confined to church and the occasional visit to and from relatives. 
playing with neighbor, ki neighbor kids was very rare. We didn't go on play dates. We just played by ourselves. Uh, I re remember attending two birthday parties when I was growing up. But we celebrated. I'm chewing on a cough drop. One moment. We celebrated birthdays at home in many different ways, but big birthdays and report cards always got the same treat. For dessert, we had angel food cake with strawberries and whipped cream. And oh, that was so good. Um, in the rural world, it was like one great big science lab. We get to play outside. And one Christmas, we were given a chemistry set. It's in a metal box, but like so and like so. And somebody mentioned that, wow, you must have come from a rich family to be able to afford something like that. Well, you know, you think back on it, none of us knew quite what we were at the time. We could have been rich, we could have been poor, but life was the way it was. We played outside. Um, the chemistry set was moved outside quite soon because it had a lot of chemicals in it that nowadays would be hazmat uh, qualified. And the winter day that we decided to try to, the experiment of burning sulfur. So in the house, we took a shot at that. The chemistry set got closed up, went outside, and waited for summer when we could play with it in one of the outside sheds. Uh, in Minnesota, you can't have uh, fireworks. So for the 4th of July and Memorial Day, my father would bring out a section of blasting fuse. And we'd light both ends, and it would sparkle and pop and slash. And that was our fireworks. And when that's all you have, you think that's pretty cool stuff. And we enjoy that. We also had guns and uh, target practicing with a special treat on Sunday afternoons. And we did, went with the hunting and uh, act as receivers. We were retrievers. We were sent out to get the birds if someone shot a, a pheasant. We were driving tractor and pickup before the age of 10, because that's what you did. Now, my sister and I had to drive the truck together because she, neither of us could do all of it at once. So she took the steering wheel and ran the pedals, and I did the shifting. And between the two of us, we got the, the grain truck out of the fields and up to the granaries, and the hired man would take care of it from there. And we were never allowed near the elevator with the power takeoff because people got hurt with them. Anyway. Um, when it came time to dissecting frogs in school, that was no big deal. We'd been cleaning fish and chickens for years, so you know it was not particularly exciting. Uh, we also learned girl skills. Uh, that was more in the winter. We sewed our own clothes. We sewed all of our dolls' clothes. We learned to cook and to clean. Uh, my job in the baking was baking bread, and I still to this day enjoy baking bread. TV didn't arrive until I was in fifth grade, and then only two channels, one from Alexandria and one from Fargo, both in black and white. Um, school and church and 4-H were the social offerings and expanded when we were allowed to legally drive. We had been driving for years before that, but then it was legal. In the 1960s, higher education for girls was pretty much a choice between teacher or nurse. My sister went to college to become a teacher. I was discouraged from pursuing a four-year college degree and instead enrolled in a three-year diploma registered nurse program, followed by a advanced practice nursing specialty program in anesthesia. Uh, in the fall of 1965, my senior year in high school, my father died of a heart attack. In the spring, I graduated from Ashby Public School. I had attended school K through 12 in the same building. And in many cases, with the same people from kindergarten through graduation. This is my graduating class of 1966. There were 33 of us. It was the largest class that had graduated in years. So when somebody says, oh, I came from a small, uh, my graduating class only had 70 people in it, I'm thinking that's pretty good. And then when somebody tells me there were thousands, I'm just, it's beyond what I can comprehend. Anyway, uh, after my father passed away, 
uh, my mother and I knew we would have to leave the farm's debt. That fall, shortly after his death, the livestock and some of the machinery was or auctioned, and Mom and I wintered on the farm before having a second auction the following summer. So, in August of 1966, my sister Mary returned to Concordia College in Moorhead, my mother moved to a new job and an apartment in Fergus Falls, and I went to nursing school at Swedish Hospital in Minneapolis. The chapter on Ashby closed. I still have the farm and return to Ashby once a year, so I still have connections there. Well, after you graduate from nursing, you get a job. And my first job was in trauma and orthopedics at Hennepin County General Hospital. Now, Hennepin County General Hospital was an old-fashioned hospital with wards, and it had 18-person wards, one for men, one for women. And then when it got a little busy, they put beds down the middle of that ward so we could accommodate up to 20-some. What I remember most about that year was uh, Christmas and the Salvation Army because it was going to be my first Christmas alone. You know, when you're new on the job, you get the less good shifts. So the 3 to 11 shift was my assignment for that day. And at about 6 o'clock that night, uh, the Salvation Army arrived. And they came in in full uniform. And each of, for each ward, they had a present wrapped for each one of the, the patients. And they sat down and visited with the patients as they opened the gifts. Now, they were simple gifts, you know, a handkerchief, bar of soap, the little things, because the people who came to Hennepin County General were the people who would now qualify as being homeless. And uh, we just took care of them. They were our patients, and here we are having Christmas all together. So after they had opened their presents, then the band came in. The Salvation Army, heavy on the brass, but they still did a great, they were, it was great because you could hear all the Christmas songs. So from my patients and for me, that was my first Christmas with the Salvation Army, and I truly appreciated it and gen donate to them generously now after even 50 years of uh, having remembering that. Uh, After um, graduating from anesthesia school, I met a guy who worked for the railroad. His name was Tom Jones. Uh, and at the same time, I was being approached by USAID uh, regarding possibly going to work for them in an uh, anesthesia program in Indonesia. This was during the peak of the Vietnam War, and uh, the USAID was basically the feel-good arm of the CIA. Anyway, uh, Tom and I talked about either getting married or me going to Indonesia. So we decided that we'd compromise. Uh, he, he would agree to, well, it was humanitarian prenuptial agreement that we would do something after we retired. So I, I had my, uh, let's see, let's go with this one. Oh, that got little. Okay. Okay, suggestion. There we are. There we are, back to where we were. Suggestions, hit the escape button. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, now I have to find myself over here. Okay. So, on Groundhog Day, February 2nd, 1974, Tom Jones, a railroader, and Ann Anderson were married. Uh, railroad, working, railroad work means moving around. So we moved from St. Paul to Duluth, back to Minneapolis, and then on to the ranch in Montana. Now, this is a picture of my graduation from nursing school, and also the other picture is uh, a picture of an anesthetist working. Uh, that's what I did for a living. Uh, and you never... As long as nobody knew I had been there and the patients thought, who was that? Who's billing me? Uh, I felt successful because if you're quiet 
and everything goes smoothly, it's been a successful phase, anesthetic. So we moved off to Montana. This was our ranch in Montana. Uh, oh, I'm trying to make it comfortable with a pad and it keeps sliding off. We'll discard that. Anyway, uh, we moved to Montana. Tom had graduated from the University of Montana in Missoula, and we, uh, had, he had always wanted to go back. I was a farm girl. I thought it would be fine to have a ranch, and off we went. Um, so eight years after a, uh, eight years after working in regional trauma centers in Minnesota, I was working in a small rural hospital in Hamilton, Montana, uh, serving the community at that time, and it has continued to, in fact, it has grown and expanded, which is really rare for small rural hospitals. Most of them just fold up and close. This one is still going, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I first started as a staff anesthetist, and when my, the other anesthetist retired, I became uh, anesthesia, director of anesthesia services. That meant that, that, that I just had more things that I had to do. And I had a recovery room, the operating room, outpatient surgery, and obstetric to cover. Uh, there was one other anesthetist who worked with me, and we covered 24-7, 365 days a year. And uh, that's a lot of work. But hospitals are open 24 hours a day. They don't close, so we had to be available. Uh, meeting the anesthesia needs of friends and neighbors in situations both joyful and in crisis uh, was a daily event. I also taught uh, advanced cardiac life support for the Northern Rockies Cardiac Network. Uh, when I had first got to the hospital, there was a bit of resistance to modernizing and coming up to care standards that were well accepted across the rest of the country, but slowly but surely we pulled up to speed. And in 19, 1995, I went part-time, and at that same time, I opened a small business called Partners in Safety. Basically, the plan was to serve the community in a more proactive manner uh, with safety training and OSHA compliance uh, recommendations. Uh, to, pre to prepare for that, I completed the core curriculum for industrial hygiene at the University of Montana in Butte. It was very interesting, and I'm glad I did it. I also became an instructor trainer for medic first responders and the American Heart Association. Ranching and working full time was exhausting. It was great fun. We had family come regularly. This is my niece, Molly. She is now the mother of three. She was about 12 on that picture, and that was her first summer driving the tractor solo and pulling the pipe trailer while we laid pipes. She was very proud of herself, and I was proud of her, too. And is this the Bitterroot Valley? Uh, we're on Sleeping Child Creek, uh, which is an off valley of it, and uh, that is um, Ward Mountain behind us. Let's see, where are we going? Okay. Uh, other pictures from the ranch. This is, we love to go on trail rides. And this is me with my, one of my horses, Dawn. She ended up being an excellent pack horse. And uh, we'd take the family and other people and we'd head off into the mountains. And uh, it was just perfect. It was great. And then it was come along and this is a, a trail ride with my two nieces and a neighbor lady who had extra horses because we had to borrow horses when the whole family came and uh, up at Lake Como. If you've ever been in the Bitterroot Valley, south of Missoula, you've heard of Lake Como. So we've got, um, let's see where we, I'm moving along. I'm almost ready to go to the Peace Corps. Okay, okay. So after I had retired and um, from anesthesia and was running my own business, um, Tom was offered early retirement, and uh, we accepted that. So we've had the farm, we had the ranch, we put the ranch on up for sale. And people said that it would take about six years to have a ranch like that sell, because that's basically what it did, and that's how the real estate market was at the time. Well, it took three. 
So we sold to what is, was a new age group from Massachusetts. They were coming out to have new moon drummings. And we thought, okay, that's fine. They had the money and they were willing to buy and they seemed like nice people. So what, how the process went was, in, the, in late summer of 1997, under a full moon, while floating on the Bitterroot River, a New Age group signed the purchase agreement with closing scheduled for 28 days later under the same phase of the moon in the same location, and the whole pre process would be uh, take place in a month. Now, that whole process is a story all of its very own, and it could go on for hours, so I'm stopping at that. Anyway, 28 days later, we moved to Missoula, closer to where uh, Tom had been working so he could finish out his time before he got his early retirement. I continued with Partners in Safety and uh, working for the Northern Rockies Cardiac Network as well as adding parish nursing to on my list. The Christmas letter that year read, sold the ranch, moved to town, all is well. <laughs> okay, the next chapter we're going into is 1997 to 2004. After Tom took early retirement, um, I reminded him that we had a prenuptial agreement. And during that time, we had also purchased a, a lot on Flathead Lake in Polson, Montana, right on the golf course. So I said to Tom, you know, what are we going to do? And he said, I'll do whatever you want as long as I don't have to, you know, we don't have to pay because some volunteer programs do charge you. I said, okay, I'll see what I can come up with. So I went searching for a program that would accept married couples over the age of 60 and provide medical insurance. That was another thing. The US Peace Corps was the only organization who met that criteria. So over the next 18 months, during which we had the bombing of the World Trade Centers, Tom and I went through the application and acceptance process for going in the Peace Corps. We were sent to Bulgaria. Now, Bulgaria is right here. I'm, on, I'm looking sideways at this. Okay, now up here is the Ukraine. Down here is Greece, Turkey, and Italy. So this is where we ended up. Uh, it's a beautiful country. We really had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful time there. Um, and let's see, but while having the house, a new house built and moving, uh, we made the process, got organized and moved on. So we're moving, we're moving to Polson. We're going to Bulgaria basically simultaneously, but we got it done. Peace Corps adventure began in the spring of 2002. Uh, I closed down partners in safety, volunteer activities, set up the process for bill paying, uh, found a house setter and a person to buy the car all at Safeway. That's a story too. Uh, said goodbye to the family and friends and headed on out. Now, many people questioned our sanity. And you know, I, looking back on it, I can sort of understand that. We flew out to, uh, New, through New York City to Sofia, Bulgaria. The transit time was about 30 hours. There were 70 Peace Corps volunteers going there in one group, and 50 of them completed it, the full assignment two years later. Our assignment was to Gabrovo, Bulgaria. This was the apartment building we lived in. We lived on the 12th floor. The elevator worked most of the time. And actually, Tom got fairly good at making the small repairs like all the other guys in the building. And over here, we have the sports arena. And up here is the Museum of Humor and Satire, which in itself is a bit, uh, um, how would you say, uh, well, it's a little bit odd because Bulgarians are known for being less than humorous. But they're wonderful people, and we had a great time. Now, people ask, what is the Peace Corps, and is it still working? Yes, uh, and it was the same Peace Corps that was started by John F. Kennedy and uh, Sergeant Shriver back in the 60s, 
And there are two uh, Peace Corps volunteers who I know who live here at Royal Oak. Uh, Arnie Vogel and uh, Marge Thomas were both Peace Corps volunteers too. They don't talk about it as much as I did because I had a really wonderful Peace Corps experience and I really don't know if theirs was as good as mine was. But uh, there were ups and downs in the job no matter where it was. The way the Peace Corps works is a government sends a request to the State Department requesting Peace Corps volunteers to be placed in their country because they want development assistance. And uh, Bulgaria at that time had just come out from under communism and it was needing developmental assistance. Now, the job description that comes with your job title is rarely something that fits really even close to what you end up doing. But the point is that if that country was able to write a good, clear job description, they wouldn't need a Peace Corps volunteer. So the more scattered and random it seems to be, the more they need you. And that's what we went to do. Um, our title was, we were Corpus Nemera Dobrovolsi. Peace Corps volunteers. My job description was Pomesnos de Pascoros Vitie. I was a community economic development person. I was put in a small YMCA and my job was going to be youth development. You know, this all, when you think of a government process, you think, well, it, it, that's how it works. Because I had come from medicine and business, we didn't have any children, and my job description was economic development, and I ended up in youth development. I loved it. It was great. Uh, my main job was, uh, as one friend jokingly put it, translating English into English. <laughs> because if you've ever written papers or articles uh, written by people who don't speak English as their first language and who use Google Translate, you know that things get just a little odd sometimes. So my job was to proof all of these things and uh, get them understandable. Um, I, one, of the funny st one of the funny things, well, first of all, I worked with kids all the way from first grade up through about um, their second year in university. And these kids, uh, you know, what do you do with a group that age span? So I worked with the older kids for the first year and the younger kids the following year, I had the older kids working with them. So they learned how to do one tear down. And what uh, we did a lot of was um, English Kids Club. So these older kids would work on Saturdays with the younger kids and we would uh, um, do, first. the first thing we did was to have, I had them uh, color a turkey and I told them about Thanksgiving. By the end of the first year, these kids were writing stories in English, bizarre stories, and doing illustrations of comics for them. And I was so proud of these kids because they got, they got their little groups together on a Saturday and they would be just head down on a table, just busy as can be. And I'm thinking, yes, this is what I wanted to happen. And they had to do it in English because their parents wanted them to learn English so that they'd have a future. One of the, um, I, I have a whole list of various stories that come from this, but I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna have time for that because we still have things to do. Anyway, Tom's job was with the city government. He uh, actually had the only digital camera in town. And it was about 100,000 people and he had a digital camera. And this was at a time when the city, the Opshina, was trying to sell or interest Western European countries in buying old derelict land or uh, um, factories that had been used during communist times. So Tom and his counterpart would be put in the city car and sent out driving through the countryside, trying to, oh, that's the wrong, I wanna be in a different, oh, I'm one way. Okay, trying to uh, find, um, things that they could sell. Um, let, me, let me go, I'll show you this one. This is, this is one of the things that they found. This, this on, on this side is uh, what was a communist 
meeting headquarters during communist times. It was very secret. Nobody went there. Now it's been vandalized. And on the top of this is the, all the cell phone towers and all the TV antennas. So going from closed completely to broadcasting everything, I just thought that was an interesting irony. Now, as far as this goes, I would love to know the story behind that car. I'm told that it's a 1950-something Ford. And if that's true, that was the height of the Cold War. And all I can see in my mind was writing this mystery story about the KGB driving this car around and you know, all that. But I never did anything with that idea. So now we're going to go back one. Okay, when we came into Bulgaria, um, we had 10 weeks of in-country in training. And during that time, we were learned Bulgarian language. And this is the Cyrillic alphabet. Everything is in Cyrillic. And uh, it's actually really not that difficult because everything is phonetic. Um, I learned how to grocery shop, buy train or bus tickets, uh, get some simple directions, and uh, it was all in first person singular present tense. But fortunately, people were very kind and understood about all of those things. Anyway, we also, Tom also, as I listed as recycling, or no, rescuing wayward U.S. tourists. Um, we had a Regularly, some wayward English speakers would come through town. And one afternoon on a Friday, a couple from Massachusetts riding a tandem bicycle came looking for an apartment, for a place to stay for two nights. Well, at that same time, the Balkan Youth Festival was having its dance festival there. There wasn't an empty room in town. My kids even couldn't come up with something. So we looked at each other and we looked at them and said, well, I guess we take you home with us. So every now and then we just took people home with us and it worked out fine. I also learned the value of a credit card. I had uh, kids coming by regularly asking for help with filling out forms and the like. And one day, one, of the, one Thursday, a girl came by and said, um, I need some help because I need to get my SAT scores to McGill University. They've offered her, they had offered her a four-year full-ride scholarship. And I said, yes, she said, but I have no way of sending them the scores. She said, because I need a credit card in order to send that to McGill. So I said, come on up on Saturday and we'll work it out. So I brought the credit card in on Saturday and she came up with her dad. And her dad was probably about in his late 50s. And he was holding his hat like this in both hands and just almost trembling because he was coming to see the American to ask for help. And his daughter and I sat down, filled out the forms, and hit the send button. And off went you know, the credit card to move her SAT scores onto McGill and a whole new life. And then her dad came to pay me for this. And he counted it out in that day's exchange rate. So he carefully he did that. And I still see them. I lost track of her. But knowing her, uh, she graduated from McGill and probably has a master's or a doctorate in something and has made so much use of that one option to access a credit card because credit cards weren't available in Bulgaria. They had just gotten checking accounts. And it was an interesting go round. Anyway, we came back. And it was in 19, in 2004, we, we came back and we're okay. And uh, out to a very large house. Uh, it was time to catch up with business, medical situation, family, and friends. But then we needed a bit of action. So in October of 2006, I had been volunteering with uh, Kootenai, the Salish Kootenai Tribal Authority. And we got a call wondering if we'd like to be elders for the tribe because in order to send their hotshot crews from firefighting down to Florida to help with the uh, um, uh, hurricane cleanup, they needed to have official elder, listed elders. 
well, Tom and I, you know, he's from England and Scotland, and I'm from Norway and Sweden. But we said, I called down the basement. I said, Tom, do you want to go to Florida for the winter? And he said, sure, why not? So we became Salish Kootenai elders, and off to Florida we went. When we returned from Florida, we got a fifth wheel and a truck and started wintering in Florida. We liked the warm weather. So in 1988, we sold the big, 2008, we sold the big house and moved to a condo in Minnesota to be near fam family and to make uh, snowbirding easier. After we had been in Minnesota and commuting a couple of times, we decided that we needed to do an around the world trip. Oh, I jumped right through the collage. Okay, I'm backing up here a bit. This is all Gavrovo and Bulgaria. Um, I have the pictures over in a book over there, so at the end, if you want to go and look at them, you, you can. But this is uh, native costumes, the kids in costumes, and various houses and the like, uh, National Historic Site. This was, I mentioned, the House of Culture and Humor, now the Hughes of Humor and Satire. This one, again, is in our apartment building. This is the building I worked out of. Its uh, architectural style is Lenin, Stalin, Baroque. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay. And uh, this was, like I said, our apartment, a church. And this was a big statue that was in one of the parks. And the guy in the statue was wearing the same kind of coat that Tom had gotten at a secondhand store and was wearing. So I thought that was pretty cool. Then this is the building he worked at. This is a few pictures of the kids I worked with, my kids. Uh, this was Tom at work, and I did a number of kids camps, well, two kids camps in Sofia, and we gave out scarves from Inca Gabriel. This was trains and planes and automobiles, how you get around Bulgaria. And this was, I'm getting an award from the U.S. ambassador to Bulgaria for running kids camps for the embassy. And um, uh, I, I thought that was sort of funny because I got a properly gold embossed award. So after we've gotten back to the United States, sorry about that, uh, when you do these, this, you mix them up once in a while. So we got back and we got, we still had itchy feet to travel. So in 2010, we started planning an around the world trip. It was a once in a lifetime, do it now or don't do it. This was the book I used because we did it all independently. Booked, booked it all, planned it all, and set it up. And once again, uh, I asked Tom, I said, um, what do you think of an around the world trip? He said, sounds good, as long as we don't have to take anti-malarial drugs. I never asked why he didn't want to take anti-malarial drugs. I just booked onto the CDC and the FDA's websites and found places where you would, we could go that we didn't require anti-malarial drugs. So then we had to choose the duration of the trip and make a budget for it. Uh, our transportation choice was from the book, the advice of the book. And the book guy said, um, use a consolidator, which is an air, air, plane, air ticket consolidator. So we picked the places we wanted to go, the dates we wanted to go, and then I called up on the phone, and then two hours later, we had booked airline all the way around the world. And it was all in one packet. Now that comes in really handy in a little while. Uh, and also with the first, with the flight, I always also made the first night reservations at all major stops. So when we flew into Auckland, we knew the address of the hotel we were going to and each place from there on. We planned uh, country um, activities and transportation just within the country and we picked it up as we, when we got there because it's always fun to, you know, find the special um, festivals that are going on and saying, oh, we can get there and going and doing those fun things. Uh, we took an uh, in-country tour group at two places in Egypt and Jordan. We went with English-speaking guides. We planned that in advance. 
We started gathering items to fit into one carry-on. We, we each had a carry-on and a suitcase. That was it. That took us for four and a half months, 25,000 miles. Now, we also had to get our legal uh, documents. You bring your powers of attorney and your uh, all of those same things we have here because if something happens to you in a foreign country, you go to uh, the embassy or the consulate and they will ask you for your power of attorney and all of these. And if you have all of it with you, it's much easier. Um, when we checked into L in, in, in LA at the air, at uh, who were we flying? We were playing Qantas to uh, New Zealand and I passed the bundle of tickets about like so that I had all printed off and our passports to the um, check-in desk. And the lady scanned our passports and typed in the first little bit, and then we stood there. And we stood there, and we stood there, and I'm thinking, oh no, is this gonna be the story of how this all goes? You know, what could I have done differently? And she looked up at me and said, you're going a long way, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, we're going around the world. She said, it's booking, it's checking you through all the way. So at that time, we were checked through. From that point, we simply went to the check-in desk, handed out our passports, zip, zip, and on we went. And when you are booked through from a country, you rarely, if ever, have trouble in customs and immigration because they want to know where you're coming from and when you're leaving. And we had that all booked in before we went. And that was very nice. Then it comes to when you're on the road for that length of time, you have to do the basic maintenance of life. So one of the funniest things we ever put up with was haircuts. You know, we all have, oh, so-and-so cuts my hair. Oh, isn't it a lovely job? Well, Tom had a buzz cut. So when we, he needed a haircut um, in Thailand, we were walking down the street in Krabi, uh, which is on the coast, beautiful little town, and we saw a picture outside, a barber, what must have been a barber shop, and it had pictures of various haircuts, and you could go up to him and point. That's the way to do it. So he went up, pointed at the buzz cut, and went in, and I'm sitting out on a chair waiting for him to finish, and all of a sudden I hear, no! I wonder what that was about. And then in a little while he comes out, and he took his glasses off and looked at me, and I said, yes, a good haircut. And he points at his eyebrows. They were, they were gone. <laughs> And I, he said, well, here's what happened. He did the haircut, and then he pointed at my eyebrows and said, same, same, and I nodded. <laughs> zip, zip, they were gone. And then he said, he pointed at my mustache, and I said, no! <laughs> so that's where the no had come from. But um, there were endless selection of stories. I mean, haircuts are some of the best stories we've got. We've got the flaming... Uh, a little Q-tip and the whole thing story, and it's funny. Anyway, we got asked a lot of questions, too. And one of the questions we were asked is, how did you get here? This is awfully brave for Americans to do, because we end up in these strange little out-of-the-way places that sounded interesting. And uh, we had a great time doing it. And in New Zealand, we had a camper. We got a little camper van. And uh, I talked Tom into that by saying, you know, yeah, we're going to get a camper. Everybody camps in New Zealand. And he said, okay, if it's raining, we're not going to be camping. I said, okay, so we'll get a motel if it's raining. Yeah, that works. So that was all fine. And two nights of the 10 days we had the camper, we, we got motel. But that was a small, small thing. Anyway, another question we were asked was, do your children know where you are? <laughs> no, we don't have children. So that's a picture of me on the other side. I wrote a blog and kept contact with people. And this is a picture of me writing the blog for the week on the back of our camper in a campground in Omaru, New Zealand. It was great. Anyway, uh, after having been asked if our family approves or knows where we are, the next question, statement was, oh, I wish my parents would do something like this. So we got both the approval and uh, uh, puzzlement. 
the world proved to be a very user-friendly place. You know, yes, you muddle along here and there, and you have to learn how to cross streets in different places because sometimes it can be a bit dangerous. But back in Minnesota, after this adventure, and after two years of driving back and forth, we decided to sell uh, the Minnesota condo and move to Sun City permanently. Tom was no longer driving, and I did not enjoy driving the whole 1,700 miles on my own. So we moved to Sun City, Arizona. So that gets us from Minnesota to Montana to Bulgaria, back to Minnesota, and on to Arizona and Royal Oak. And what's the story that goes with that? One cold, dark, and rainy night here in Sun City, I was awakened with water dripping on my foot fingers. One of the kids in Bulgaria couldn't remember the word for toes, so they referred to toes as foot fingers. And I still, whenever somebody says toes, I think Kalina and foot fingers. <laughs> anyway, the roof was leaking, which meant a trip to the attic to find the leak. Because if you find the leak when it's really, you know, leaking, then you're going to have better luck fixing it otherwise. So up the roof, I, up into the attic I went. Now, in a duplex here in Sun City, one trip to the attic is enough for a lifetime. You don't want to ever do that again. So we took Harold and Marjean Peterson's advice and moved to Royal Oak. Some people I know here have searched and researched and figured out all the status of everything here at Royal Oak. We just believe Harold and Marjean and we're so glad we did. It was much easier. And uh, Tom's memory and medical issues progressed. And on April, 8, uh, April of 2018, he passed away. We had utilized three levels of care here at Royal Oak, each with much appreciated safety nets for life. And as we all know, life is filled with many different opportunities and adventures. Some choices are expected and foreseen, others come as a bit of a surprise. So when a new neighbor moved in a few doors down the hall from me in Area 11, I greeted him and initiated a short, a short chat as part of being a neighbor. We, were both, we had both lost spouses or partners within months of each other's, and COVID restriction had pretty much locked us all up here. We remember that, your little table outside your door. Okay, during the hall chat, he mentioned that he really enjoyed live music. I noted not a parking lot COVID programs, and he replied, no, I don't want to go down for that. I answered, well, then just come over and listen for my balcony. He did. Life goes on. And thanks to Nada's COVID program, I have learned to dance. <laughs> so thank you, Eric Klein, for being part of the next chapter of Life's Ongoing Story. Okay. And I made it in in 50 minutes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you, Anne. That was terrific. What an interesting life. And thank you for sharing it with us. Do we have questions, comments, anything else? Good one. What's the name of the book? That you want to the name of the book is The Practical Nomad, How to Travel uh, Around the World by Edward S. Broker. You can, I'll, I'll set it up here on the table. I have a few things up on the table if you want to ask questions or look at stuff. What countries did you visit on your round the world trip? Huh? It's okay, it's okay. It's, it's okay, we had little feedback there. Um, we went from the uh, United States to New Zealand, to Australia, to Singapore, to Thailand, to Egypt, to Jordan, and then into Europe to visit friends and acquaintances, ending up in Spain with uh, our family members and on to England and coming home. So we did miss out, we, we you know, you have to, you can't do it all. And uh, picking those countries, uh, 
Tom was happy with those countries. I, I was happy with those countries. We, uh, we did planes and trains and buses and cars and campers and uh, um, an endless number. And if there, if it was, oh, and a ship. We took a ship uh, from uh, Sydney to uh, New Caledonia and back, because I'd never been to New Caledonia, nor many people I know have been there. It's really an interesting country. They speak French, and they mine a large section of the world's nickel. You always find something interesting. Oh, and when we were in Egypt, we left Egypt on a Sunday, and on Monday was when the Arab Spring started, So, and we were in Jordan, and Jordan was peaceful. But that was just a nip of it. Any other questions or comments? Well, I want to thank you again so very much. I want to thank our tech crew is always here with us, and they're just great. So thank you, Don and Jan, and I think Chuck's back there, too. So thanks so much to you. And I wanted to tell you before you get up and check out Anne's things uh, that next week we have a bio box, and I hope you will be here for that. That's going to be Carolyn Modine talking about Harriet Tubman. A week later, we have another bio box, and we're going to have George Brashide tell us about Audie Murphy. So we've got lots of events coming up. I hope you can make them, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs>